Greetings and welcome to lecture number four of unit number two, the thermal design of refrigeration system components. Uh, this lecture we are going to discuss uh, uh, the evaporator, which is the most important part of refrigeration system, uh, types of evaporators and uh, some design aspects of evaporators. Evaporators are mainly classified uh, based on the two, that is flooded evaporator and uh, direct expansion evaporators. Basically, it's a type of heat exchanger, uh, but uh, evaporator and condensers are classified in a different way than uh, the classification of heat exchanger like parallel flow, counter flow. That is based on the construction, that is generalized classification of heat exchanger. But as far as evaporators are concerned, they are mainly categorized into two, flooded evaporator and DX type evaporator, that is direct expansion evaporator. Uh, flooded evaporator, in that case, the liquid, liquid refrigerant covers the entire heat transfer area. So when the, uh, the flooded itself has a meaning, when uh, the heat transfer area is flooded with refrigerant, then it is uh, something like that. And the flow of refrigerant takes place uh, generally outside. So uh, uh, the moment we say flooded means the tube is flooded with uh, the refrigerant. So generally in flooded evaporator, uh, the flow of refrigerant or evaporation is taking place outside the tube and uh, if it is taking place inside the tube then most of the heat transfer area is covered with almost entire heat transfer area is covered with the liquid refrigerant. So flooded there are both possibilities uh, the possibility of evaporation inside the tube as well as possibility of evaporation outside the tube. Uh, in direct expansion evaporator, a part of heat transfer area is used for superheating the vapor and the flow of refrigerant takes place inside the tube. So here, uh, there is no other alternative. Uh, so whenever the flow is taking place inside the tube, there is a possibility of direct expansion as well as flooded evaporator. But when the flow is taking place outside the tube, then there is only one possibility that is flooded evaporator. But DX, uh, then how to recognize when the flow is taking place inside the tube, then whether it is DX type evaporator or flooded type evaporator. So how we can recognize if at the outlet of the evaporator, if uh, the state of refrigerant is superheating, then it is called as a direct expansion type evaporator. Because the, evapor uh, the, vapor the refrigerant vapor evaporates directly, expand directly in the tube. And at the outlet state, it is mainly a superheating vapor. So again, with the help of expansion wall also, we can recognize generally flooded evaporators are associated with float type expansion wall. And uh, the this type, uh, DX type evaporator, they are generally associated with thermostatic expansion or capillarity because there's the state of refrigerant at the outlet is superheating. So these are the two main classes of the evaporator. Now, first of all, we'll see uh, uh, the flooded evaporator, construction working of flooded evaporator. This is a generic diagram of flooded evaporator where the evaporation is taking place inside the tube. So this is an evaporator coil. Uh, so this goes to come. So this is coming out from the condenser. Now this is associated with float type expansion wall. So the level decreases, flow starts, and when flow takes place through this expansion wall, it expands, means pressure and temperature reduces. Then a constant level is maintained. So then the liquid is made to flow through this particular, uh, so uh, from the bottom, it is made to flow through this particular tube where it absorbs heat from the surrounding. So here it is fins are provided. So here it absorbs heat from the uh, air. Some cases if it is submerged in some brine solution, it absorbs heat from brine solution as well. So due to absorption of heat, uh, some of the refrigerant gets evaporated. So you can see circular dots. These are the vapor droplets or vapor pockets and it still remains still at the outlet also. So the entire heat transfer area that is flooded with liquid refrigerant, that's why it is called a flooded evaporator. So here the state of refrigerant at the outlet is also uh, liquid or wet and state of refrigerant at the inlet is essentially liquid refrigerant and here it is uh, uh, liquid plus vapor, some part of vapor is also there. But this is uh, accumulated in the accumulator. So in the accumulator part, which separates liquid and vapor. So of the upper corner, upper portion, the vapor is accumulated. At the bottom, liquid is deposited. 
So only the vapor is sucked during the compression stroke, or so during the suction stroke of the compressor. So vapor is sucked. But there is a possibility of some liquid droplet also comes. So some baffles are provided at the accumulator outlet. Uh, so that is a good. But this type of evaporators are more effective. Here the refrigerant is fully utilized because till the end, the latent heat is uh, not a single vapor is superated in this case. So the entire latent heat is utilized here. So obviously the thermal performance of flooded evaporator is more. But at the same time, it requires more quantity of refrigerant. Uh, so almost 1.5 to 1.7 times more quantity of refrigerant is required in flooded evaporators. Uh, as compared to the DX evaporator. Uh, that's why uh, uh, for cheap refrigerants, uh, the cost of the refrigerant like ammonia, CO2. So for such refrigerants, uh, generally the flooded evaporators are adapted uh, because this refrigerant cost is less. Uh, this way the flooded evaporator works. This is a, a simple schematic diagram of in-tube flooded evaporator because here the evaporation is taking place inside the tube, but it satisfies the second uh, first feature that is the entire heat transfer area is flooded with the liquid refrigerant. So that characteristic it satisfies, that's why it is called as a flooded evaporator. Uh, this is a typical uh, flooded evaporator. Again, in this flooded evaporator also, the evaporation taking place inside the tube. Uh, this is used in cold storage, but it is also associated with surge drum. So this liquid lines, so common liquid lines are there. So through this liquid line, refrigerant flows and it returned back. <coughs> so liquid vapor is accumulated in the surge drum or we can say accumulator. Uh, so only vapor is escaped from, uh, the, from the top portion and it enters into the compressor. So this is coming from the condenser. Here it gets expanded, so float type expansion wall is used. And due to throttling, then from the bottom line, the liquid is sucked, liquid is taken and it is circulating through the evaporator pipelines. And with the help of, uh, so it cools the air. So this is uh, air cooling, flooded uh, evaporator construction. It is air cooling, fin tube uh, uh, evaporator. So here it gets cool. So this side, the air comes and it comes in contact with the evaporator coil. So it is cooled and then it is delivered to the cold room, cold, cold storage room. So this is the way. So this way we can recognize if it is provided with the surge drum, and uh, then it is definitely from outer construction, it is, we cannot recognize whether it is flooded or DX. But uh, if it is associated with surge drum or accumulator or float type wall, then definitely it is a flooded evaporator. So this is a pictorial view of flooded evaporator. Uh, the typical two lines, uh, the surge drum, which is not in the picture, but it is connected here at the system. So, the second type here, that is a flooded cooler, that uh, that is flooded shell and tube cooler. So especially, uh, it's a shell and tube heat exchanger. Uh, but as far as the flooded shell and tube evaporator is concerned, uh, the arrangement is there. Because in this case, uh, the evaporation is taking place on the tube. So obviously uh, in the shell there is a refrigerant and through tubes, the liquid which is to be cooled circulates. So this is one pass, two pass. This is two pass shell and tube heat exchanger. And the arrangement is that, there that liquid is uh, entering into the shell from the bottom. So it is accumulated in fact. Uh, so if it gets evaporated, so from the top, it is connected to the compressor part. So this is a suction outlet or the, uh, that is the outlet that is connected to the suction line of the compressor. This is a dropout area where uh, the vapor deposits and the entire tubes are submerged in the liquid refrigerant. So that's why it is called as a flooded. So obviously whatever the evaporation is taking place that is on the tube uh, and the liquid which is to be cooled that especially the chilled water or any other liquid it is uh, made to flow through these tubes. So when it comes in contact with the tube surface, so it gets cooled and at the same time, it absorbs the heat from the liquid refrigerant and liquid gets evaporated and accumulated at the top. So in such type of evaporator, generally uh, the top 15 to 20% portion is 
kept vacant so no pipe no tubing is there so to, to provide the space for accumulation of vapor and then it is connected so this is a flooded shell and tube evaporator so one fin tube flooded evaporator and this is flooded shell and tube flooded so as far as this shell and tube evaporator is concerned we have to be specific that is the flooded or dx so such type of uh, coolers are generally used in uh, used along with uh, the screw compressors so centrifugal compressors to cool water or grind and again uh, basically for flooded evaporator they're generally recommended if uh, the cost of the refrigerant is low or uh, costlier refrigerant uh, generally flooded evaporators are not recommended uh, because it increases the initial cost here the initial cost is substantially uh, high for flooded evaporator because the refrigerant cost if the running cost is concerned that it, uh, this flooded evaporators are more efficient than the dx type evaporator this is a pictorial wave this is evaporator line that is inlet outlet and through this is the common header so through pipes uh, the cooling water and again it is two pass because partition is there so one pass and two pass because twice it flows through the shell that's why it is two pass through this twice so according to the number of passes there is multiple of two that is two four six eight like that so as the number of passes increases you are getting higher delta t uh, if the number of passes are less you are getting shorter delta t but at the same time you are getting uh, more pressure drop across so most of the cases uh, number of passes are not recommended but some cases if you want more cooling then uh, it is recommended so this is a pictorial view of the same this is some uh, advanced spray chiller uh, manufactured by uh, kirloskar plant sorry uh, kirloskar chillers so one variation of flooded cooler is a spray type shell and tube this is another advanced type of uh, flooded shell and tube in that case the pump is installed at the bottom and the pump continuously pumps the refrigerant uh, bottom refrigerant and it is spray over the cooling coils so more automation is taking place and the heat transfer coefficient is uh increase substantially uh, because heat transfer coefficient is adversely affected by the pressure and the spray can be used to cover the tubes with the liquid rather than a flooding them and because of uh, the atomization of the refrigerant droplets the rate of evaporation increases uh, but at the cost of pumping power uh, because uh, the evaporation in still fluid and the evaporation in moving fluid agitating fluid or external obviously the heat transfer coefficient is more in this particular case as compared to the previous case so its heat transfer rate is more this is for your information only there is another configuration that is in some big systems uh, like uh, uh, the meat preservation or the coolers used in uh, the ice factories or the evaporator coils used in uh, the fish storage tanks or the large marine uh air conditioning systems or refrigeration systems where the big uh, uh refrigeration or big uh, evaporator room is there so in that case uh, then uh, uh, the huge piping is let down on the ground like that now that in that case uh, naturally that fluid will not flow through this pipe so some pumping is required so additional pumping is there uh, so you can say this is from the liquid line it is accumulated from the bottom it is connected to the pump so that pump uh, is used to circulate the uh, the liquid refrigerant through this tubing so it avoids uh, uh, any deposition of oil here and also uh, it maintain a proper velocity that is required to come the refrigerant at the outlet of the uh, evaporator so that outlet it comes with liquid vapor mixture and only vapor Uh, is released from this chamber or separating vessel to the compressor so properly designed flooded evaporators and evaporators with liquid recirculation operate with equal effectiveness so this is one system that is a mechanical driven pumping system uh, uh, if you design a piping in such a way that if the liquid return to the chamber or separating vessel 
So no need for this particular system. So that's the properly designed flooded evaporators. And evaporators operating with liquid recirculation. That is operate with this liquid recirculation. Operate with equal effectiveness. So the effectiveness of this system is equal if the flooded evaporator is properly designed. Uh, on the basis for choosing between flooded coil and liquid recirculation, serving a multiple coil, multiple coils uh, with a liquid recirculation system, the pump and separating vessel add to the first cost, which is not true for flooded coils because a recirculation pump is an added cost. So on the other hand, maintenance cost of this such kind of systems are very less. Uh, as compared to the flooded, because there is no problem of deposition of the oil in the oil. Uh, using flooded coils is usually high because of multiple locations where the oil must be removed. And so maintenance cost obviously is more in flooded evaporator. These considerations lead to favoring flooded coils for small systems, perhaps three or four evaporators and pump recirculation for large installation. Uh, so if the flooded evaporator is designed properly, we can use flooded evaporator for uh, three to four evaporators, uh, uh, coils. But pump recirculation is generally uh, recommended for large installations. So where the piping length is in uh, almost more than 100 meter. That circumstances generally it is recommended. This is uh, called as a pump circulation system or post liquid recirculation system. Only uh, the addition of pump, which is required uh, to make the flow possible or to return the liquid as well as oil from the system, from the evaporator to the pump. System. So, this is a simple schematic layout, so same as previous, but that for the previous one was the skin, the 3D diagram. <coughs> and here it is saying that the evaporator, liquid pumping, and the entire system is there. It is compressor, then compressor to condenser, condenser to high pressure receiver. From high pressure receiver, it goes to the uh, accumulator through the low side float valve. And then from the bottom, it is pumped and circulating to the evaporator. At the same time, it returns because of this pumping. This is a pump circulation system. Generally, in the examination, uh, short note can be asked on pump uh, recirculation, uh, pump circulation system. So, this is expected. You All these points you cover in the short note, and either you Draw this diagram or this diagram, that both are correct. That's it all about the flooded evaporator. We have discussed almost four types of flooded evaporator systems with pump recirculation. Now, the next classification is direct expansion evaporator. So, this is extensively used in most of the refrigeration systems uh, because of its uh, low initial cost as well as. Uh, Maintenance cost is also there. Yes. These are some types of direct expansion evaporators. Natural convection type evaporator pipe, uh, force convection type, and double pipe, shell and tube evaporator, shell and coil type, and body lead coolers. So one by one, we'll discuss. So this is a natural convection type evaporator, which is generally found in our refrigerator. It's a type of plate type. Embedded tube plate surface evaporators, refrigerant in refrigerant out, used in refrigerator, display cooler, and deep freezer like that. The second one is a forced air cooled. This is fin tube uh, evaporator or fin tube heat exchanger, we can say. So, generally found in our air conditioner, window AC or split AC. So Self explanatory. You already learned this that is, at the inlet, it is. Wet refrigerant at the outlet it is essentially a superheated refrigerant. So that is a condition required here. So no wet because these are generally connected to the expansion walls like thermostatic or capillary. So 
no liquid is permitted at the outlet of the evaporator. Uh, this is shell end tube evaporator, but it is DX type shell end tube. So only change is that. Uh, so here the flow configuration is changed. So flooded shell end tube evaporator. In that case, refrigerant flows through the shell, and uh, liquid which is to be cooled flows through the tubes. Now here it is exactly a reverse. Here the water or liquid which is to be cooled that flows through the shell, and uh, and the refrigerant flows through the tubes. So obviously at the outlet, it is a dry or separated refrigerant. So uh, the type wise, it is same. Only the flow configuration is reverse. Here, uh, the water or liquid, which is to be cooled, flows through the shell. Flooded, in flooded case, it flows through the, uh, it flows through the tube, that water or liquid, which is to be cooled. Vice versa, refrigerant. So this is generally used in chiller plant, central AC or processing unit, uh, but uh, generally preferred for uh, costlier equipment. Oh, sorry, costlier refrigerant like R22 or 134A and other HFC blends. The cost is uh, high, almost 10 times more than, uh, in fact, uh, 10 times more than the ammonia refrigerant. This is DX type shell and Construction wise, there is no difference, only difference in the configuration of the fluid arrangement. So, this is one pictorial view of DX type. Here, the chilled water flows in into the shell, out of the shell, and uh, refrigerant in, liquid and vapor refrigerant in, vapor refrigerant out. This is used in chiller plant, central AC processing. Level. And the third, uh, next type that is shell and coil type. Uh, this is coil. It's generally immersed in the tank, filled with some liquid or gas or liquid or water, which is to be cooled. So, uh, generally, our water cooler configuration is of this type. So, water in, store water out. Maybe it is flowing or maybe it is a uh, storage water. This is a circulating coil. Refrigerant in, refrigerant out, so section out. Uh, such type of coil here, uh, the quantity, uh, the simple coil tube used. This type of cooler has the advantage of cool water storage. In some models, tank can be open for cleaning. Most applications are at low capacities like uh, bakeries for photographic laboratories and for cool drinking water is used. The coil tube containing the refrigerant can be either inside the tank or attached to the outside of the tank in such a manner as to permit it. So these are some, this is uh, one of you of uh, shell and coil type, and such type of Heat exchangers are there, small heat exchangers. Also, water cooler is our example. Uh, this is a special type of cooler, which is called as a body light cooler. Uh, body light coolers are used to cool fluid to near its freezing point. In industrial food or dairy applications, generally it is used. In this cooler, uh, the fluid is circulated over the outside of vertical plates, which are easy to clean. The inside surface of the plate is cooled by evaporating the refrigerant. The fluid to be cooled is dis distributed uniformly along the top of the heat exchanger and then flows by gravity to the collection plant. It is collected here. So it is, this is a water or liquid distribution troughs, and from these troughs, it's Distributed and the so the evaporator coil is sandwiched in two plates here. The cooler may be enclosed by insulated wall to avoid unnecessary losses here. Ammonia is commonly used with body light cooler because these are the uh, used generally in large installations. So ammonia is preferred refrigerant for large installation and uh, arrange for flooded operations using. 
conventional gravity feed with surge drum, a low pressure float fall mechanism now maintains a suitable refrigerant liquid level in the surge drum. Now, modulate coolers using other common refrigerants are generally of direct expansion type now, almost direct expansion. So these are some uh, pictorials, pictures of actual photographs of the body light coolers. So this is a package one. This is only a coil. Uh, this is second one. This is a film type. Some pictures where the body light coolers are used. Especially used in soft drink, uh, milk storage, or uh, any uh, chill water plants. These are used. Then the next come plate type heat exchangers so for alpha level, the main manufacturer of the same. Plate type apertures are used when the close temperature difference is required, so close to 0.5 K. So these are the most effective as far as the refrigeration or the system COP is concerned uh, because it, uh, it allows us to maintain a very low temperature difference between the boiling refrigerant and fluid being chilled, that is around 0.5. These evaporators are widely used in dairy plants for chilling milk, in breveries for chilling beer. The overall heat transfer coefficient of plate type heat exchanger is very high because most of the plates are uh, perforated plates. So very high heat transfer coefficient can be maintained. In addition, uh, they also require very less refrigerant inventory. Refrigerant quantity is required is also very less, about 10% or even less than that of shell empty. It is very easy to clean because this we can easily dismantle all the plates. We can increase the cap capacity by increasing the plates as well. Uh, and we, we can clean it by disassembling the plates. The capacity can be increased or decreased very easily by adding or removing the plates. This is about the plate type heat exchanger. Uh, this is a pictorial view of raised plate type heat exchangers. Then, uh, plate shell and tube. This is another configuration where the plates are uh, enclosed in a shell and uh, the fluid particles is similar to that is circular plates. So all the circular plates are enclosed in a shell. So refrigerant flows through these points and it's simultaneously get put into the common header. It comes out. This is in. So alternate plates, it enters. And it leaves from the uh, so refrigerant in the shell. Suppose this is brine in brine out. This is uh, because <coughs> this is a special type of plate and shell type heat exchangers. So with this, we have finished uh, the classification of DX type evaporators. These are some types which are used in practice. Maybe exam point of view, it is not that much important because you already discuss in uh, TE syllabus different types of uh, uh, evaporators used, but just we have revised that syllabus. Only the pump circulation that uh, that was the different part that that can be asked because that was not included in TE syllabus. So there are some. Uh, thermal design considerations of the evaporator because evaporator design is the most complicated design uh, uh, compared to condenser design uh, because uh, what will happen the design of uh, the complexity is arises because of the following uh, generally on the external fluid side if the external fluid is air that mostly happen in air conditioning systems or cold storage yeah, in addition to sensible heat transfer, latent heat transfer also takes place uh, as moisture in air may condense or even freeze like this uh, on the outer surface. The evaporator surface may be partly dry and partly wet depending upon the operating conditions since mass transfer has to be considered in the design. If the frost accumulation uh, is there, then the heat transfer resistance varies continuously with the time because uh, frost accumulation it uh, in reduces the rate of heat transfer. So this consideration should be there while designing because here we cannot calculate uh, the total heat of the air by using formula in CP delta T. So that is only a sensible heat. If your uh, uh, 
uh, air loses some water vapors. So water vapor is it condenses. So like this, here it is to consider droplets of water, wet coil. So in that case, uh, that is because of the conversion of vapor to liquid. So, so some latent latency also need to be considered. So that part is also considered during the design. That is first part. Second part on the uh, refrigerant side, the heat transfer coefficient varies widely with the, when evaporation takes place in the tube. So in tube evaporation is a little bit complicated and due to changing flow regimes, accurate estimation of heat transfer is not possible. So this is a changing, so flow regime is continuously changing. Initially it is liquid. Then uh, as it absorbs the heat, it starts converting into vapor. So when it proceeds to the outlet, it's completely vapor. So as the refrigerant changes its phase from liquid to vapor, obviously its specific volume increases. And uh, as it is accommodated in the same confined space, its velocity increases. So the velocity increases and the heat transfer coefficient is a function of that velocity. So heat transfer coefficient, you can see it's continuously increases with increasing distance from the inlet on the leading edge. So here is the peak heat transfer coefficient. So we cannot take a constant heat transfer coefficient. So there are some correlations available uh, to calculate the inside heat transfer coefficient. But later on, it generally gives uh, a maximum heat transfer coefficient that is around 0.7 to 0.8. So obviously, uh, uh, we get more heat transfer rate if we maintain this dryness fraction that is 0.7 to 0.8 throughout. So that generally happens. Uh, so if the dryness fraction is close to this 0.7 to 0.8 to the maximum portion, then it gives the maximum rate of heat transfer. So this way we can enhance the rate of heat transfer because by controlling the flow rate as well. Uh, so because this, this increases because of uh, increasing velocity of the refrigerant because refrigerant converts to vapor and the vapor as it converting, its speed increases. So obviously, due to increasing velocity, heat transfer coefficient increases, which is desirable thing, which is desirable for heat transfer point of view. Because it, that's why uh, the flooded evaporators are more effective than DX type evaporators. So this is the case. Uh, and generally, in flooded, uh, most of the portion is covered with wet refrigerant. Uh, and in the dry portion, that so the average heat transfer coefficient, obviously, in, Flooded is greater than that of DX. So, uh, selection of or calculation of heat transfer coefficient is a difficult task. So, based on the applications and based on the constructions, we have to choose the right correlation to calculate the heat transfer coefficient. The lubricating oil, uh, so deposition of lubricating oil on in the evaporator coil, that is again a uh, main concern, you can say, as far as the maintenance is concerned, because uh, most of the lubricating oil is not miscible with the refrigerant. Uh, so uh, what happens there, so as the refrigerant evaporates, it converts into vapor, but lubricating oil deposits there. Only. So the separation oil affects both heat transfer and pressure drop characteristics. Because if the oil deposits, uh, so it obstructs the rate of heat transfer. So minimum refrigerant velocity must be provided there because for oil carryover in DX type evaporators because if the oil deposits there, so there is a shortage of oil in the compressor and uh, maybe in due course of time, there is a failure of compressor happens. So the proper velocity must be maintained and needs some simulation where uh, uh, we have to investigate so whether that velocity is optimum or not, because optimum velocity, because if the velocity is too high, it leads to increase the pressure drop, which is also not desirable. Because we already seen in a reciprocating compressor that change in evaporating temperature, in fact, lowering of evaporating temperature decreases the COP or cooling capacity drastically. So if the pressure drop happens in the evaporator, it is not at all desirable. Part. So we have to restrict that also. So the adequate velocity to be maintained. So a lot of uh, simulation work is required while deciding the refrigerant velocity. Uh, compared to condenser, again, 
in continuation of this compared to condenser refrigerant pressure drop in evaporator is more critical yes because there it more, it is more sensitive to the cooling capacity as far as reciprocating compressors are concerned as it has a significant influence on the performance of refrigeration system hence multiple circuits may have to be used in large systems to reduce the pressure drops refrigeration velocity Uh, to reduce the pressure drops refrigeration velocity has to be optimized taking suppose uh, such kind of multiple circuits are used so instead of one inlet if we provide the multiple inlets so the path of the refrigerant is reduced so this is one path this is second path this is third path so such kind of evaporators help us to reduce the pressure drop it is multi and most of the evaporators are like that you can see this these are the uh, multiple outlets means there are multiple inlets as well so there are 1 2 3 4 5 five outlet means five inlets are there so this is a pictorial view you can see there are multiple inlets and multiple outlets are there so common header means there are multiple inlets and common this is outlet part so this way um, the refrigeration velocity has to be optimized uh, taking pressure drop and oil return characteristic into account so 0.3 and 4 are taken into considerations for uh, maintaining a proper velocity to minimize pressure drop as well as to uh, maintain oil return uh, characteristics part load application also we need to consider because in part load generally there is a possibility of evaporator flooding uh, because part load uh, less uh, refrigerant evaporates so you have to is flooded with uh, even in dx type you have it is flooded with refrigerant and during suction stroke that refrigerant may enter into the compressor and it causes the compressor sludging uh, this aspect has to be uh, considered at the time of evaporator design because at the time of designing uh, the uh, the designer must know what is the application whether it is continuously using for four full load or if it is using for part load then they have to make a separate provisions so for uh, monitoring that or regulating the flow maybe in multiple circuit uh, case by providing multiple circuit we can regulate or we can modulate the capacity of the evaporator as well but if the evaporator is flooding with the re liquid refrigeration then there is a possibility of liquid entering to the compressor especially in reciprocating compressor then it causes the sludging part sludging part is nothing but the carbon uh, sticky sludges are formed and this may stick the walls of the compressors and uh, there is a possibility of compressor breakdown so the care has to be taken that while designing the evaporator whether that evaporator is to be used for load capacity and if it is to be used for part load capacity whether how how is its uh, percentage part load and accordingly the provision is made so in this topic we have uh, covered the different aspects of evaporators or types of evaporators how to recognize dx and flooded type evaporator that we have discussed and then we have also explained uh, what is force liquid recirculation or a pump circulation system this pump circulation system is especially used for large installation it is a substitute to flooded evaporator when the flooded evaporator uh, causes problem of maintenance or if uh, in flooded evaporator uh, there is a problem of oil return then generally pump circulation is used with additional pump is there so that we have discussed in Should be able to put different types of flooded as well as DX evaporator and uh, applications of flooded as well as DX evaporators. Thermal design consideration that is a important part here. That is new part. So that we should be able to elaborate the five points we have discussed. And generally, these five points you can consider writing a short note on design considerations or thermal design considerations. uh thank you very much uh, in the next lecture we will mainly focus on the evaporator problems the numerical part of the evaporators
as far as the numericals are concerned we mainly focus uh, dx type uh, evaporators so dx type uh, humidifying coil dx type shell and tube heat exchangers shell and tube evaporators so uh, some heat transfer principles or so heat transfer equations we are going to use there uh, i hope this is again a informative topic uh, maybe uh, only few points can be asked for examination only the uh, thermal design considerations and pump recirculation so remaining part is only for uh, sharing the knowledge but the commercially the types used that with the help of photograph i have tried thank you very much